So please help me in welcome Tom Keegan, Dr. Tom. Keegan. I do appreciate being taken advantage of, so thank you, Art, for that. Um, and, and I should just say, so this, this I'm going to talk about the assignments um, in part that you guys worked on over the past few weeks, but I, I think that less as a lecture about that, you will, you're about to endure a handful of four, maybe fewer, maybe more years of lectures, so I will try not to make this a lecture and make this more a conversation. Um, but I want to get started by talking. Does anyone recognize that room? It is this room, yeah. That is McBride Hall uh, in the 1920s. And just in an effort to replicate what we see there, and because I rarely get a chance to, I'll stand, I'm not going to stand there the whole time because I can move my slides, but I've only worn these shoes like three times, and I wanted to <laughs> make sure I can stand back there, so I want to make sure you all saw them. Um, There's, in teaching rhetoric, you guys will, most of you endure it, um, and hopefully enjoy it. There's a study that came out last year about public speaking, and I know that's like the thing most students dread about public speaking, they're like, yeah, they don't want to do it. Um, and the old wisdom is tell yourself you're calm, right? I mean, you're like, or, or imagine people in underwear, as if that somehow they, makes things less awkward. Um, <laughs> but the study found that if you tell yourself, whether you believe it or not, but if you tell, if you say telling yourself I'm calm, I'm okay, if you tell yourself you're excited before you do it, people perform much better. Um, so just so you, but I don't have to tell myself that because I'm excited to be here, hence the shoes. <laughs> um, but I, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, start there since this is what this is. And, I, and as I said, I'm not sure that this would be a conversation. So we'll see how long it takes. Um, if you have questions or if there's something you want to interject, I use some of your quotes. If people recognize their quote and they want to contextualize it for us, I welcome you to. Participate. I know no one will, but you can make the offer. Um, so I'll start with uh, an old joke about higher education and exams. You know, why not start college by talking about tests? Um, so there's this there's this joke. There's a student sitting in a lecture hall like this, and he's trying to complete his exam, and. Uh, and not succeeding. So he's kind of looking over and taking notes, or cheating, whatever I thought. And, uh, and the instructor is standing down there at the, at, the, at the bottom of the lecture hall with the table there, and he's watching this kid you know, pilfer these answers and feed this knowledge. And as people start to come down and they put their exam booklets on the table, you know, the instructor is patiently waiting for the student to come down. And so the student comes down and the instructor says, hey, what are you doing? This is what I mean. So I've been watching the whole time. Cheat, you've been taking answers off other people's exams, I've been looking over people's shoulders. And the student looks at him and says, Do you know who I am? And the instructor says, No. And the student says, Good. And shoves it into the pile of exams. <laughs> so, not, that's not like a tip. That's not a tip. Like, <laughs> I have advice at the end. That's not, that's not, that's like anti-advice. I tell you that story to emphasize, you know, my major point, and one I hope that you, whether you realize it or not, as you were working through this um, assignment, is to not be anonymous. Because it's really easy, especially at a large university, to be that. I mean, for many of us, or some of us, that's the appeal, right? It's like, I'm going to talk about high school class sizes in a minute, and you know, you're maybe a known quantity. And Iowa perhaps offers you an opportunity to not be that. that I guess if you want that, fine, but I would encourage you not to embrace the anonymity. Um, and so to kind of talk about that, I want to tell you initially the story of my first year. I mean, it seems fitting, right? It's like your first year, your first day, or like the week before your first day. So I went to uh, a fairly equally large um, public university. I went as an undergraduate. I went to the University of Virginia. And I came from a relatively small 
all guys Catholic school in Massachusetts. I think my graduating class is like 217 students. I'm going to put that in numbers you might recognize. And I think I was like number seven or 11 or something in my class, like high enough to think highly of myself, you know? <laughs> but I didn't get into the Virginia's honors program, which was like deeply offensive to me. And so they had this, they had this thing where you could, you could kind of petition to get in after your first semester, so I was very determined to like show them how wrong and misguided they had been, charging me twice as much tuition as instators and like, not recognizing my academic brilliance. <laughs> and I, along the way to proving myself, I, I found myself in Calc 1, which, which you, I finished the bioethics and English major, just to put this in, you know. I was going to be like a pre-med, but that didn't last very long, since bioethics. It was much easier to do philosophy than biology. Yeah. For me, for me, maybe not for you. Um, and so I, I quickly realized that I should have been placed in pre-calc or something else, anything else. Um, I, I ended up, my, my favorite, actually it turns out after four years in college, my favorite grade was a grade I got in, during the year. Um, and it was the mean on the exam was an 84, and I got, I got a 48. So, yeah, I mean, that, I figured from honor students that would generate more of like a cringing kind of ground, but fair enough, I had to go maybe down with being the bottom of the, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I got this and I was kind of horrified because this is not the person I understood myself to be, right? I mean, college, and as you will find, college often does this to you, where it, it brings into view a self that you were not aware of. And so I, at that time, and as you may discover, like, depending on how many credits you're enrolled for, it becomes impossible to extricate yourself. So you miss, because my count was going fine until after the drop deadline, and then all of a sudden it got hard. So then I couldn't drop it, like the deadline had passed, and I couldn't withdraw because I'd be underloaded, and I didn't want to do that. So, so I went to see the head of the math department and explained, pleaded my case, and we seemed to be understanding. My TA was literally named Oleg Smirnov. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's not a joke name, it was his real name. And he was very patient with me, but the, you know, something was always kind of lost in our conversations, like what I was supposed to do. And <laughs> And so I finished that semester with a very kind of like gracious, I think it was like D plus or C minus or something. And I finished the semester with, with, with not what I expected when I started. I finished with, a, and this is like, you guys will soon be grade grubbing, GPA chasing, irritants to instructors, I'm sure. Which again, not a tip. That's just an observation. And I encourage you not to be that. Um, I had to go like 285, which is not going to get me into any honors program. Um, but the other thing that happened during that semester in two, Art's point about making a connection was that each dorm had been assigned a kind of uh, faculty mentor. In this case, it was a dean of students. And so I would occasionally go to him. I think when I started getting worried about what I was doing in Virginia, I started talking to him. And we became friends. And he was very encouraging in terms of you know, sticking with the pursuit of honors. So the next semester, I, when, when we could apply, I was like, well, screw this. I'm not going to do like, these prerequisites or the you know, boxes, the, the curriculum you're supposed to do. And I took only English classes, and uh, I took Buddhist meditation, and I took like, you know, figure drawing, and uh, stuff I wanted to say. I started pursuing my education instead of pursuing the curriculum. And I did fine. And I had that interview, and ended up getting into the honors program. And only after I got in did I have a conversation with that dean later. And, and here I was, even then, I was like, this is great. I did so well, they must have seen the promise. And he said, yeah, it's true, they saw all that, but also I put in a good word for you. And I, which is cool, I didn't, I didn't feel undermined. I mean, I think that, and that's one thing, that you can't, like one of the lessons that is good to learn early on is that you cannot do it by yourself. And it's extremely hard, I think, sometimes for honor students to understand, because you're all very bright, and you're all, I'm sure, very accomplished and very ambitious, but it doesn't happen because of just you. And it's not going to. So when you get these group assignments you don't want to be a part of, which you will, it, it's, better to, it's better to understand that as an opportunity for success than a roadblock to it. Okay? Whether it's honing your skills as like a leader, necessarily, that's what you're trying to call it, or someone who, or a manager, or someone who says, okay, I'm really good at photographing stuff, so let me do that, and you write the captions to them. 
But understanding that you can't carry the whole thing, and a good instructor will give you an assignment that's too big for you to do it on your own. And that's when you fail, when you think you, it's like, screw you guys, you guys are, yeah, you're great, but you're not as smart as me, just let me do it, you can take the grade, it's fine, I just want to make sure we get the good one. You're going to fail. So I think that idea of making a connection with one another, trusting one another, and seeking out and talking to faculty is really important. So, all right, so that's the opening gambit, okay? I want to talk about, go back to this anonymous thing and kind of discover yourself. Well, we don't know you. Um, we'd like to, and your instructors are here to help you, but we don't know you, and here's what I mean. Like, we only know you, and I'll just show you three graphs, okay? And this is some of our understanding of who you are, and so it's like your hometown size. Okay, we know you on paper. So hometown size, for instance, right? You have to fill these things out. Like, what the hell's he gonna do with this? This is bullshit. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, like I need a slide. So I was like, I give us the numbers. So on paper, eleven percent of you. These are kind of rough percentages. Eleven percent of you who, who did this assignment come from hometowns of under two thousand people. And fifteen percent, two thousand. And I just made up the. I mean, I know you have two thousand and one to ten thousand. That's a big difference. Yeah, I understand. But I don't want to have too many slices. You know. 55% of you, under 100,000. And then we didn't, you know, some of you are coming from towns, or city towns, cities, metropolises of a million people, and 2% over a million people. So, you know, that's so cool. I can categorize you that way. I mean, I can categorize you by gender, and ethnicity, and race, and class. I can do all kinds of stuff like that, too. There's another one we've got graduating class size. So, you know, I mean, some of you, my God, this class is super small, like 100, like under 100 people. You're like, yes, I was first in my class. I was also last. But, you know. <laughs> like that, that number three person is like, this sucks. I was last in my class. Like, we were top three. Um, <laughs> but again, this is, this is kind of to the point, right? And the idea is like, how do you see the same thing in different ways? So we can look at you on paper here, um, and just, <laughs> this is kind of, I don't know, telling or sad, or like encourage the Iowans to feel at home at the University of Iowa. <laughs> so 54% of you are from Iowa. Uh, 45 are U.S. non-Iowa and 1% international. And I, mean, I don't know what that tells us. It doesn't tell us very much, I don't think. And I, so I think you have to think deeper, right? And you can't just go by the numbers. And that it's just as it was true for me about my GPA. I didn't feel like 285 did not, was not representative of what I could do. That was representative of my ineptitude and calculus. <laughs> and fine, I was willing to accept that. So, you're asking, like, why this assignment? Like, some of you are probably like, this is, you know, why am I doing this? Like, summer, did I not? Like, school starts in August, right? Like, the end of August. One of the things I wanted you guys to be doing at the outset, so you kind of hit the ground running here, and one of the things I stress, and some of my colleagues stress in, in rhetoric, and in the courses we teach, is this idea of public engagement. And it seems to me in the responses you generated that, you know, you, you, you understood that, that you got through to it. So what I, you know, what I was hoping is that you know, if you're trying to be known, it's not, it's not a case of, that's better, okay. So if you're trying to be known, it's not, it's not always ostentatious. Okay, so I'm saying don't be anonymous to you guys, like that's awesome, because I'm gonna be class president, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna found this thing, that's totally awesome, and I agree you should do it, absolutely, if you want to. If you don't want to, don't. But it's not what I mean by not being anonymous. What I mean by not being anonymous is being aware of the place in which you live and through which you move and engaged with it. Not in control of it, not dictating to it, kind of like this, but like engaged and having a conversation with it. Because it's through knowing other people, and I don't care kind of how corny this sounds, I think you already realize this, it just sounds lame when I make it sound like a slogan. It's through knowing other people that you come to know yourself. And I would argue that maybe more than at any other time in your life you're about to do that. And so when I had you do this assignment, I thought, okay, well, it's, 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 you were in a moment of flux, if you weren't sure. Okay, you are, right? You're, except for those of you who are from Iowa City, it's the same old boring thing, I can't believe you came here, fine, okay? Um, <laughs> you're cowards. Um, <laughs> you're afraid to move away, I get it, it's cool, there's always a couple. No, I'm serious, I'm serious. There's, there are many layers to these places. Yeah, but what is important to understand as you, as you embark on that kind of that, that moment of change is that whatever you're leaving, 
is not all that you're going to do or know. And so it's fine to be homesick. I've never been homesick personally, which is bad. I mean, my family's awesome. I don't. But I've never homesick because I know where they are. I know who they are. And I've got them. You know? I trust that. What I don't know is where I'm going. So going from Massachusetts to Virginia, I studied abroad for a year, which I strongly recommend all of you do. If you can, go. I always tell my students, go if you can at all. And then what you do, go for as long as you possibly can. This will always be here, and it will always seem the same when you come back. Well, it'll seem really different, but in a boring way. Because you'll see the world. You've been other places. You won't have been babied in the way that the American educational system sometimes does. It. But what's important is that you know, you're uncovering yourself as you progress, as you move through. So, fine, you've left your hometowns, and you've, you've got those stories. You've taken them with you. You've heard a lot of stuff. You probably, I think some of you, interview people and discover things about your hometown that you didn't know, even after having spent all of your life there, which in most cases is 18 years which is not an insignificant number of years. And that's fine, but it's not unique to your hometown. I don't mean to diminish your hometown at all. Okay? That's going to be as true of this place as it is of your hometown and as, uh, as any other place that you live in for a while. So I want I to just kind of look at a couple of the quotes that you guys, and this is another, like, they're all awesome, I have to say. I'm really impressed with what you guys did. First of all, I was impressed you did the assignment. <laughs> There's always kind of, there's always like, you kind of trust as an instructor that you get. It's like, cool, I'm going to I mean, look, and it, you didn't see this before, so you know this is who was telling you to do it, which I'm not, I'm not sure if that would have gained or lost. Um, but the idea is, like, it's always nice to see the product, the fruits of your labor. And I, I was impressed. So, you know, thank you. If no one else has thanked you for doing it, I don't know if there's like a thank you on the Baltrics thing, like the robo machine thank you, but like, I'm thanking you for doing it, because I think it's important what you did. So I want to look through six of, six of, what uh, you heard, and then half a dozen of what you said in the wake of that. Okay, and, and you know, I'll just read these, and this is something you never want to do is like read the slide, but I have, you know, you got like 35 minutes, so get like 10 seconds of slide, and don't get me through a minute. Um, and so I just kind of picked these kind of random, some were quirky, some seemed very like earnest in a way that I thought would be useful, kind of depicting a range of emotional appeals. So the weirdest sample we have is a monkey. My dad is a doctor. I don't know how those two sentences connect. Maybe it's like, like an ellipsis, like someone edited. Like, These are two great quotes, but I'll make into one. So the weirdest sample we had was a monkey. My dad is a doctor. And if someone couldn't pay their bill, they would pay with what they could. So, okay, it's, like, it's very telling about a hometown. I mean, it's like some kind of, and, and what's nice about these quotes is they're super short, right? But I think I've picked ones where there's a story beneath it. And probably the person doing the, conducting the interview, if this is yours, You did it? Oh, wow. You said it. Okay, cool. Do you want to, Are those two sentences with those right next to one another? They paid with a monkey. <laughs> You're not just... It's not like improv. You're not like... Really. Peanut brittle for another one, a monkey for... What time was this? I, have, I think I might have it in my lessons. That's Palos Park? Yeah. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> you're in Park, okay? So they were the monkey or candy. Um, but there's a story there, right? I mean, it's awesome. It's just a quote, but yet there's something there. Something deeper, more rich, something telling about the community. So I thought that, you know, it was pretty nice. We have that Spearfish Creek is one of two creeks in the world that freezes from the bottom up. We have the most dramatic temperature change record recorded. Okay? These things are just uncovering the conversation with people. I know we forced you, or kind of, you know, asked you to have these conversations, but I thought this was kind of interesting. After the war, there weren't enough schools left to accept every kid in Seoul. Also, a single classroom held more than 80 students. And it's two sentences, you know, but like, you, can, you can kind of feel it. There's a narrative, there's a story, there's something that informs. When I'm talking about how conversations inform place, I don't know, I mean, this seems to give us a very telling picture. It's just one, and all these are just threads in a tapestry. You know, no one thinks like, oh, that's Seoul. Or that's Payless Park. I hope that's not just Payless Park. Right? Like, yep, the monkey, the monkey payment is us. That totalizes us. But that's, but it, but it, it informs. It informs. And it's one of several strands that create that kind of the, fa the fabric of that community. When I was ill, people from the community bought food, gas cards, money, and countless other gifts. I still ask, how do you thank a town? Which is a mm -hmm. profound question. I feel it. Maybe some goosebumps out there. <laughs> I, I, it was, I was very struck. <laughs> I mean, I just want to uh, They may have called us swamp rats, but we were sure that people from Dyke were devil worshippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I, just, I mean, that's all. There's nothing really more. All I see is what you wrote. So I was like, oh, well, this is, there's got to be a story. You know? These are the communities. These are the areas that the community members contribute in your conversations. My favorite part of St. Louis would have to be the beer, but you can't drink, so don't put that down. Maybe. <laughs> Grim. 
but it's not my truth. And so these are things to understand about, you know, the one conversation, like I said, doesn't totalize all the conversations I have in place. Don't propose with cold fingers. Many things in life are better than digging around the snow for a frozen wedding ring. Okay. That's, that's probably, that's pretty good advice gleaned from the community. You know? Again, through a conversation somebody had. And you don't have to be a character in a Stephen King novel to live in a bubble. I thought that was review too. And that, I mean, I really like, I think I ended, I don't know, yeah, see, so that's okay. So that, I like that one because I think so many of us, I don't say you, I mean, I, no one was less ready to move here than me when I did, and I was 22. And I'll give you an example of a bubble. I was sitting in my father's office setting up, oh, uh, will date this exchange, setting up a landline for my apartment. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I get a rotary phone for that landline too, as long as they're doing it. Um, and I was having this conversation, and the woman on the other end of the line worked at the telephone company said, do you need long distance? And I said, no, no, no. She said, oh, you have a, you have a cell phone, guys, for long distance, don't you? I said, yes, that, that's correct, yeah, I do. She says, well, what are you moving to Iowa for, from Massachusetts? And I said, oh, I'm going to do a PhD in English, and blah, blah, blah. She said, oh, that's so great. That's so wonderful. Well, congratulations. So I don't know why anyone would congratulate you from going to grad school. It should be like, my apologies. I hope you do well you're $100,000 in debt. Um, <laughs> And so I, I just look, must have come over my face because when I finished and hung up the phone, my dad looked at me and he's like, what's, you know, what's wrong? And I said, well, it was the phone company. And he said, yeah. And I said, they're really nice. <laughs> and that's like, that's the Massachusetts bubble, right? It's like, you don't, like, not, you don't even know me, lady, you know? <laughs> be nice to me. Just be indifferent and dismissive and put me on hold and eventually after an hour give me what I want and it's like, totally understand that exchange. <laughs> so I wasn't ready, I was not ready for Iowa in that sense. And it took some getting used to, because I was stuck in many ways in my understanding of where I had come from and not an understanding of where I was. And I think that's important. The sooner you can break yourself of that habit of reading this place through the lens of where you've come from, and I don't mean abandoning all the lessons you've learned or your ideals or any of that stuff, whatever informed you, whether it's in your hometowns or the places you've lived, I'm talking about like, do not let that, uh, that experience totalize your experience in this place. And so what I would encourage you to do, and don't, by the same token, do not let this place, your understanding of yourself in this place, to the extent that it's limited to understanding of yourself as a student at the University of Iowa, totalize your experience here too. Because you are not, and I would encourage you not to think of yourself as students at the University of Iowa. You are now, where you're about to be, students in Iowa City. And that's much, much larger than Burge, McBride Hall, Dom, the River. Like those of you who will be in my prime time thing tomorrow will see that, you know, I you do mental maps, and I guarantee you, like every single student draws the river. Like, okay, cool, we go, there it is. And then everything kind of radiates out from the dorm you're in and the river. And everything stops by like, Gilbert Street. People are like, where's Gilbert Street? <laughs> like, you'll know, you'll know, and then next year when you live past Gilbert, you'll be like, oh my god, when you live on the east side, you live on like, South Dodge Street, destroying it, and like, you know, being disgusting. And it's like, you'll know, your map will always expand, you know, in terrible ways. Um, but, but, don't limit, but don't limit your understanding of the city to the university, because it is not. They are not the same. They're part of the same shared fabric, but they uh, themselves are not the same. And you are not, you don't get to live in that bubble. Because when you walk out of here and you go downtown, it's not even your downtown. It's like Iowa City, it's yours. It's like Iowa City, it's ours. And the sooner you start understanding that and engaging with it and dipping into it and taking advantage of it in the best possible sense of that phrase, I think that the sooner you're going to appreciate it and help move yourself away from this understanding of like, well, I'm homesick, this is my place, or it's mine, I can do what I want with it, and more like it's a shared experience that will continue to inform who you are as a people. And that sounds like the more you know kind of thing. But it, it's true. It's, it's, it's really true. And you are about to engage in, so, like, as I said earlier, some of those like the most formative four years of your life. I hope that they are not what people often refer to in a really horrifyingly earnest way, the best four years of your life. Like, I hope they are, like, the next four. And then I hope the next four after that are. Like, it's really depressing if you're going to be, like, 40 years old, and you're telling, like, your friends, like, oh, man, college is the best four years of my life. It's like, oh, my God, dude, you're 40. 
So, <laughs> 18 years later, you're still like pining for like tech stands or something. Like, it's not. It's like, what? Is that your life? Is that your life? Because mm -hmm. these four should be the best, okay? And then every year after that, you continue to be the best that you can make it. But that only happens as long as you're not willing to cling to the past. Stay informed by it, but don't stay beholden to it. Okay, so for all of you who succeeded in high school, which I assume is everyone here, it's like, <laughs> those are the one person like, actually, I didn't. <laughs> don't tell anybody, I don't even want to raise my hand and explain this to you. Um, great, I'm glad you did. But that's over now. And you've learned your lessons from that, and now you apply them, and you learn new ones along the way. Does that, does that, does that, does that make sense? Okay, I was confused. Like, okay, don't, wait, you make what? Learn lessons or not? Um, I want to I want to I want to talk a little bit more about a couple things. I want to kind of about a quarter of or so kind of wrap it up because I'm cur I, I'm very curious. I mean, you were willing to admit that you were the clunky quote person, so maybe there's like great people who want to ask questions because I'd much much rather ask questions or have you ask me questions than than just talk to you despite all appearances. Um, I do not have a rhetoric section. I have other classes to teach this fall, so I don't get 20 students, or 60, about three sections or something, who are, you know, like, or a captive audience, or like a captured audience. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to take this opportunity just to, to run a couple other things by, as long as I'm giving advice about the power of engagement and narrative. I wanted to, to say, just share a couple things with you um, that you might take into consideration next week. And one is, for those of you who are in large lecture halls, like something like this, like I never, this is kind of a fantasy. It's not like, oh, listen to it. They're all looking at me. Um, <laughs> I don't usually teach classes like this or talk to audiences this large. But you will be, many of you, in lecture halls like this next week. And the first day of class will happen, and you'll be like, you know, listening to the sit down, tired, welcome to class, blah, 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 you still listen. At some point during that first week, if it's not the first day of class, and maybe the second, I think it would behoove you to walk down the steps instead of flee up them and introduce yourself to your instructor. I know some of you like, that is the most ass-kissing, <laughs> bullshit advice I've ever heard. <laughs> I'm done with that. I, I was like, I did that in high school, I'm not doing that here. I promised myself I wouldn't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is not going to come across that way to your instructor. And you might say, well, it's, it's, it's irrelevant because I have, a, I have a discussion section, so I'll do that to my TA. Which I was like, ah, it's not the same. It is... Especially, and this goes back to my point about anonymity, it's especially important to put yourself on the radar of the people with whom you want to work. Okay? So if you're an engineering major of some stripe and you're in a lecture hall like that, go down. This may be the faculty member who two years later, three years or four years later, is going to be writing a recommendation for you. Start it off right. Introduce yourself. No, one's been, no one thinks you're going to be a great grubber initially. You know? You're just you're making yourself stand out. Okay? And you're, you're cutting through that haze of anonymity that covers the whole lecture hall. Okay? Not all lecture halls are this bright, too. It's like, you know, your instructor might even see anyone there. So what I'm going to do that. I would suggest you go down, shake your hands, introduce you, shake, shake, shake your hand, introduce yourself, and, you know, whatever. The next thing you do, this, okay, and this is not like scumbag advice. This is like, this is a rhetoric teacher, right? This is my whole field is persuasion. Okay, so if you're looking to persuade your instructor that you're someone worth knowing, you introduce yourself, and then at some point later, they have office hours. Okay, whether they want to or not, they have to have them. And I find office hours woefully underused at, at this university. And I think that's a shame. And people think, well, if I go to office hours, I'm betraying some kind of ignorance. Like, obviously I don't know something. I have a question. So that would then, they'll think less of me. It's like, I can't, no good instructor will think less of you for saying, like, I don't know this, could you explain it to me? Right? I mean, if they do, I mean, that's a bad instructor. You don't get out of the class. Um, go down, or even if you don't have a question, go down and have a conversation with that instructor. That is the kind of stuff that breaks down the anonymity and helps start defining you as a student in their eyes, if that's what you want to do. But the other thing I'll say, and I, I do this on behalf of all faculty, I think. I think I feel, I very rarely do I feel like I can confidently speak on behalf of the faculty of the University of Iowa. But I do, on this point. Do not complain about your grades. Okay? And I know this is not going to get any applause. Um, it's not because I think that the fact is always right. I mean, I'm sure they're not. And it's not that you're always wrong, so therefore you can't speak out. But if you take an adversarial stance with respect to your grade, the grade is the point of contention. You are not here for your grades. 
you're here to learn. So it's always better to go down and say to the instructor, okay, so I see you gave me this, which if I'm dealing with honor students, like B plus. It's like, oh, please, show me your B plus that you're unhappy with me. Okay, and we write on that. Um, so you go down and you look at, and not, I see there's some skeptical faces. It's like, I'm not talking about for the semester, I'm talking about on an assignment, okay? So it's like, don't worry, you can send it that A minus. But then it was still not cool. Um, but the, the idea is, you don't say, look, I want my grade changed. You say, all right, help me understand how we got to this grade. Okay? And not in a kind of snarky way. It's like, what led you to think that this was the grade <laughs> that you thought I deserved? You go down and you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm, I'm interested in you changing my grade on this assignment. I'm interested in doing better on the next one. So help me understand what I did wrong here so I can apply those lessons there. It's the same thing as life. Like, how did I, you know, if I messed up, how did I do so? And from that experience, it's not a failure so much as it's very instructive. So what do I do? That, I can't even tell you how impressed the instructor will be. Okay? You don't have to say that I told you to do it. In fact, don't, because if you tell people I told you to do it, that is an idiot, can't be took advice. Okay? So I'm not even lying. It's not a joke. It's like an honest thing. Just be quiet. Um, but those things, like introducing yourself, going to office hours, engaging with the faculty, do not wait for them to come to you. This is Iowa. It's huge. There's a lot of people. You can get lost. Do not allow yourself to. Because, as I also tell my students, sooner or later, you don't have your teachers. Right? You don't get to, and I don't want to scare you. It's like, do that. We haven't even started classes. It's like, I know. You have them for four years or more or fewer. But you're not always going to have them. So don't wait for them to find you. Go get them. It's their job to teach you. You know, some needs to be reminded of that. And it's okay to do so. Because after, because it's, it's that initiative and that imperative and that I can do this, I can do it for myself, on behalf of myself, that will help shape you. And it's going to be really useful in the workaday world or whatever your career path leads you to. Because your boss, as I can tell my rhetoric students, is not going to come say, hey, Tom, um, yeah, this is a really, this is a good report, good effort. Um, it's not great, though, so... You're fired. You know, it's like it's not. It's not gonna be like, oh, could you redo this? You know, so you have to be your own best critic and your most honest critic. So that's the other bit of advice I give you. Um, so, oh my God, it's that good. Um, I, I so I just want to kind of close by just kind of stressing that thought about anonymity, okay, and how paralyzing it can be, and encourage you. To do, I mean, do all the stuff. It's like, yes, enact the fantasy of college. Like, however lame or disgusting or elated or joyful that is, hedonistic, whatever, intellectually engaging, okay, not just all negative or pseudo negative adjectives. Do that. But recognize, too, that it's, this is your new hometown, you know? And so move more broadly in it and expose yourself. Like, <laughs> and you put it, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, and expose yourself to it in the, in the best possible sense. I get to know this town. It's yours now, okay? And it's ours, like I said. And don't let yourself simply be students at the university. Be, and I say, even, don't let yourself be students at the, in, in, in Iowa City. I mean, be, you're citizens. You're all 18, too. It's like election years are coming up. You're going to vote, please vote. Okay, that's awesome. It's like, I don't know, like, as you get a sense, my talk is kind of wide ranging. God, please vote. Because like old people are de like determining for you what your loan rates will be and stuff. Because you guys are like, oh man, that's, where is that again? Uh, I'm not gonna go to this. Like, I'm sure that someone else's grandma knows better for me than I do. Um, but please vote. There's so many of you. It'd be wonderful if you did. Um, but yeah, so welcome to the University of Iowa, and welcome, more importantly, to Iowa City. And I am happy at this moment to like feel questions. I mean really honestly, not gonna any fake answers. So who's got a question about yeah. Uh, I kinda of wonder here. Do you actually like the beard or do you just grow that to establish the beard? Yeah, do you just grow it to establish ethos or oh, okay, okay. <laughs> That's an excellent question. I like the rhetorical term people okay, so you asked me if I if I like this beard, like did I grow this thing on my face out of like self hatred or did I <laughs> This looks like you're super uncomfortable. I'm going to do this for a bunch of years. Just to prove to myself that I can. Uh, or to establish ethos, which is your question. Yeah, what is ethos? Does anyone know? Credibility. Yeah, credibility. Everyone's like, that's like, shh. It's like, it's not ethics. Right? Ethos is, yeah, credibility. It's like when, you're, it's like when you break your ankle and your mom 
It's like, oh, I think it's fine. And you have to it's like the doctor's like, your leg is like, that's broken. <laughs> you definitely don't trust your mom because she does not have sufficient ethos in that situation. Trust the doctor because the doctor's a doctor. Um, so does my beard give me more? No, I don't think so. Um, I'll tell you how I got my beard. Like, one, yeah, use that story. Or like, no, I like it. Your questions, do I like it? Yes, I like it. Um, also, you know, also, it's cut short for the summer. So, it, but like, so over, my students this fall get to witness like the winterification. Because <laughs> I, I, I ride my bike a lot, which is how I got the beard, ironically enough, because like, I was biking home and did a, like, fell over my handlebars and cut my chin open. It was like, I had two mouths, and I was like, this doesn't, this doesn't look good. Um, and I went to the hospital and had a bunch of stitches put in, and so I obviously wasn't shaving. Um, and when the doctor was cutting them out, and this is more like the kindness of Iowa City, the doctor was like, uh, some advice? I said, yeah, sure. He's like, I like the beard. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, that's okay. And I said, well, all right, well, the, doc the, the, the doctor does have ethos there, so I'm going to keep the beard. <laughs> so that's, yeah, so that's, and also, you know, it's just, you know, the pictures are still around, so it's like, it, as this turns more white, I'm like, no, no, it's, then ironically, the mustache is turning white, so it's like, can't escape my age, but neither can you. Um, so yeah. The what? Oh, this? It matches the polo. <laughs> That's Jason England, who is also a rhetoric lecturer. He's not just like, you know, some peanut gallerist. <laughs> some of you might have him tomorrow, so my condolences and apologies for that. Um, other, another question? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so the question is, what was my perception of Iowa City before I came here? Um, mixed, I think. I was, you know, an East Coaster, New Englander, a mass hole in particular, who had lived in Virginia for three years, and my third year uh, study abroad in the Trinity College in Dublin. Um, and so I was skeptical, you know, I'd never been to the Midwest. I'd been to Chicago. My first spring break, when I was in Virginia, I went to visit my cousin who was in med school in Chicago. Like, that is like, that was my spring break. Like, ooh, March in Chicago, that's me. It's like, this is, I'm not doing, I'm not, I haven't really got the college thing down yet at 18. Um, yeah, I was surprised by how nice people were, like I said. And I, wasn't, I didn't trust it, because in Massachusetts, the, the kindest thing is there. It's not like everyone's miserable. Um, but it's a, it's a kindness that does, it's not, it's not freely offered. Right, um, and I would see, and I would see, that seemed to be real. It wasn't, it wasn't the kind of, in my experience, but in other places, the more duplicitous honesty or kindness that was more manipulative or facade. Here it seemed, it seems sincere, but I think it's only as sincere as like islands aren't idiots either, you know. So it's like you can kind to you and you're a jerk, and it's like, well, okay, I'm kind of done with the kindness thing with you. Right? Um, <laughs> the longer I've been here. And the more I've circulated and connected with people, I mean, it's home. I mean, it is. I mean, I don't, I don't ever think of it as anything other than that. I mean, right? When I, so I'd be home, home, hometown, home, and I say, like, "Oh, I'm back home," referring to Iowa. <laughs> and so, I mean, now it's it's a wonderful place, you know. Um, and it's a small town. For many of you, it's a big town. I understand, you know, understandably. Um, but it's a small town. And the people, you will be as overwhelmed by its generosity as you will some of its more petty features. But that isn't unique to Iowa, and that's not unique to Iowa City. And that's, we're talking human nature there. So I found Iowa a very human place, and very giving, um, and very open at this point. But it's not, it doesn't always come across that you know, when people first get here. Um, and I would encourage those of you who haven't, aren't from here, like, not step all over it, too. Be like, oh, I am so kind. Let me take as much advantage of this as I possibly can before they're on to me. Um, yeah. What are its pettiest features? It's pettiest features? The same as anyone's, right? It's gossipy, it's small. Um, but that's not unique to this place. I mean, that's every place. It's like nothing here will surprise you to the extent that you've kind of lived. Let me put it to that one. Like, it's not, you're not here to be overwhelmed by. 
It's social dynamics. I don't think, although there are two kinds of education that happen in college, right? There's the intellectual, at least two, the academic intellectual and the social. And they're both, they both have equal merit in my mind. Okay, and many people are here to be socialized. And that's perfectly fine. And I don't mean that's like, that doesn't, that's not a code word for party. I mean, that's just to navigate other people in different <laughs> contexts. One of the things I always say about rhetoric, um, when students ask, so two things I say about rhetoric. One, one people say, uh, when students say, what is rhetoric? And I say, okay, rhetoric is the difference between asking your friends for money and asking your parents for money. And that's all it is. Um, the other thing I say is that, whereas you can hang up, like let's say you're a bio major, and you're like, I'm done with bio, man. This is a terrible week, I don't want to do it anymore. You don't have to do it. I mean, physically you're doing biology, yes, but like you're not studying it. Same with Cal, thank God, you can ignore it for a weekend, but you don't get to do that with rhetoric. When you guys go out to a party, I mean, it's like you're not sizing up an audience any more closely than when you went to that room and reading those people. And that's part of what I mean when I talking about spatial rhetoric. It's like, how do, you, how do you read the room? How do you read how people move through it? And when do your words matter more than when you're hitting on someone? Right? And, that's as much, and that's really dovetail beautifully with the academic and the social uh, education. That, that, but that's all college. I mean, that's true. So those pettiest teachers are the same as they would be anyway. It won't surprise you in that respect, I don't think. But no will. But it still informs you about as a person. And so those things that, I, th I think it's along those lines, those things that at first seem problematic, um, like I remember being in fourth grade, and in fifth grade you get a locker, and being like, this is going to be horrifying. How many remember my combination? There's three numbers, and it's like, and you're looking at the thing, and it's like, it's totally a problem. You look at the problem, and it's totally a problem. And then, yeah, you know, a week later, it's automatic. But you still do, you still engage. So obviously it wasn't a problem, it was just this new thing that I had to encounter and didn't quite know what to do with it. And after a while it just became part of who I am. And it's something I do. And I think it will be that for you too. And I mean part of this talk is about is, uh, is trying to help you pick that up more quickly. Do not continue to see it as a foreign entity that needs to be conquered or needs to be you know, held at bay. It's part of who you're going to be. Just as your hometown is part of who you are. Just as if you study abroad, you know, like Milan or Tokyo or you know Berlin or someplace, is going to be who you are. Okay, all those things help, and that's that's that power story too, the experience. But all those things help define who you are, and that's an awesome thing. Right, that's an awesome thing to leave high school. If you're dissatisfied with who you were, don't worry. Okay, you've got plenty of time and experience ahead of you to kind of define yourself and be defined by your experiences. Uh, one, are there any more? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not going to tell you my favorite place in Madison because I go there and I don't want 520 freshmen <laughs> building up my favorite place. <laughs> you can find your own favorite place. Um, you know, there's one place that's, it's, there are a couple of interesting places. There's, above the bio building, there's a greenhouse that no one knows is there and it's open. I mean, not to the elements, but if you can just walk in. And I think that, that that's something that always made, that amazes me about students. Where it's like, I can't go in there. It's like, well, who told you? And I'm not saying just go in. <laughs> like, there are all these things you can do and see that for you. I mean, you should explore. I mean, so, so I think that's an awesome space that no one ever goes to, including me. So you should totally go there. Um, but I do think it's really important. And for those of you who are in my uh, primetime workshop, you'll do it tomorrow and the next day, it, just to explore the city. I mean, it's so important not to just, like, it's amazing how, how you just get here, it's really scary. Maybe for some of you it's like, I'll just stay on campus. And it's like, oh my god, I want you to. That's like the most boring part of the city is the campus, you know? Like walk around, go east, go west. Well west is pretty disgusting, but go east. <laughs> it's a hospital, you know, like, ooh, parking lots in the hospital. Um, but go east and walk around. Um, I, I think that their bio city has a ton of parks. Those of you who brought bikes, ride them. Ride the hell out of them. Especially now, if we've got a lot of stuff to do. If you don't have a bike, get one. I don't know why. Like, I don't know what you're doing with no bike. Get one. That's totally crucial. Like, do you want to be like one of the, the like the masses crammed out to the bus, or like shuffling along like zombies on the sidewalk, like navigating the gum and puke? Like, you want to do that? Do so, get a bike. Get a bike. That is like that is my number one piece of advice. Get a bike. Okay? And there's a bike library. You can get one cheap on College Street at College and Gilbert. There's a little shack. It's open on Saturdays. Might be open this week too, Jim. Go to the bike library. I hope you all go too, because I don't know what they do five minutes to do. But I totally get back to it. Are there any other pressing questions? Or can people like do the data clock, the sketch set eight? Yeah? Uh, you mentioned you uh, studied classical 
uh, culture? How did you well, make well, it? I, no, no, I definitely didn't. Is that art is a, is a class. Okay. I, yeah, I was like, oh my god, no. <laughs> I studied Irish literature. So. How, how did you make the jump into rhetoric and teaching, I suppose? Oh, they were hiring? Rhetoric, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, I taught as a grad student. As many of you will be taught by grad students. We've probably done from different disciplines. So I was an English grad student teaching rhetoric. Um, and, and frankly, I enjoyed it more than teaching literature. I mean, I love literature. My dissertation was on James Joyce. It's written in the public house, so I got to do it online. Um, but it wasn't, it's much harder to teach. I, I love teaching English majors, so kudos to those who would be English majors. It's awesome. I think mean, it's a great discipline. Rhetoric is everywhere, though. Right? Like I said, it's inescapable. And it's so much easier to teach you guys rhetoric than it even is to teach a literature to an English major. Because the English major loves the book, loves the lesson, maybe loves the theory of the author and will take it and they feel like they've got some knowledge and they've got cool snippets for cocktail parties or something, or whatever, or it opens up the human experience to them. But rhetoric is like not a single one of you can say that rhetoric won't matter. It may feel like it at times, but it, it's just not the truth. And plus you already do it. So it's so easy to teach rhetoric because all I do is have you guys talk about your lives and talk about the time you needed to persuade someone to do something or a time your friend duped you for doing something. And how did you get fooled that way? Or an enemy? You know, and that, that's what makes sure rhetoric so awesome. It is everywhere. It is, uh, as the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences described it once in a metaphor, which we never let him forget about, rhetoric is the blood of the university. And I think that's true. It's kind of gross, but it's true. <laughs> so that's why, I mean, I love teaching rhetoric. So it's everywhere. Anything else? Anyone? Yes, you read there? Did you ask me people you knew? Yeah, I'd be like, yes, definitely. Are you crazy? I was like, a stranger. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I probably would interview someone I didn't know. I'll give you an example of, of, a, of someone who did an assignment like this that was perfect. I had an honor student, three, well, three honor students in this class, um, and I asked them to do something like this. And they didn't know who the interview was. They were sitting on the ped mall, which you guys have become familiar with if you're not already. Okay. It's, you guys know what the is? Yeah, okay. So there's one student is sitting on a bench and he's saying, oh, God, how are we going to interview? And he hears a, he hears a harmonica. And he sees this guy who's kind of in shambles, just playing harmonica. And he goes over to this guy because he's looking for someone to interview anyway, right? And he starts talking to him. And this guy had been homeless at one point and no longer was and had had quite an interesting life. And so they that at the time, I think it's closed now, there's a place called the Tobacco Bowl, which is about to be like a restaurant and pinball arcade. Fine. Uh, the Tobacco Bowl is a place where you can smoke cigarettes and drink coffee at the same time, which is like recently rare. And so they brought him in and had a conversation with him. And they, you know, this is some dude who, this is like, we're talking about like anonymity. This is what you don't see, right? These are the people you kind of like, um, oh, feel bad, but I got class. Because they stopped and they talked to this guy. And it was beautiful. And, and the podcast they made was stunning. And it was perfect. And I thought that was awesome. Because that's not someone they knew, that's not someone that had any business in the same orbit as, in their mind, maybe. And it became this great opportunity for them to engage in the community. And, and, by virtue of the assignment in the class, bring him and his story to life. So, I mean, I think that's, I would look, I would interview someone I knew. Because I already know them. Right? I would find someone I didn't know, someone I might not otherwise know. And, and get to know the city better by virtue of having done so. And I hope that that's what, you guys do. You know, not for an assignment, just for yourselves. And for the city. You know, we were talking about listening. I mean, talking, too, is important, obviously. Um, and so share yourselves with, with the community in conversation. I think you'll like it. If that's it, I want to thank you guys. I think I can, I'm very impressed you all did the assignment. I'm very impressed you all sat through this. And I very heartily welcome you to Iowa and Iowa City. Thank you for listening.